Hi everybody, thank you for coming back to my uh, channel, Let's Listen Together. Uh, today, I'd like to talk something personal, may I use something about my life and why I became a Christian. And so, I hope, because I mentioned to you before in the beginning, uh, about hope, peace and joy. And so, maybe when I share something about personal life, uh, somebody can maybe, uh, you know, look at it and feel that they went through it themselves, you know, same experience. And so, uh, let me say this, uh, I was uh, born in Indonesia, 1940, and so through Indonesia became independent. I, my parents had to move to Holland, I'm part, I'm part Dutch, so uh, in Holland I stayed about 12, 12 years in Amsterdam, and from there we went to the United States in 1960. And my life personally, you know, uh, when I grew up, I was actually in some kind of a, in the family, some kind, from a big family, about 12 children, 11 children, uh, I was actually the outcast, okay? Uh, when I was growing up and I was, you know, on 10, 12 years and things like it, so uh, in Holland, maybe you know, when you live over there in Holland, is uh, we were on the fourth floor, in the cold, Amsterdam, in the city, and sometimes it's approximately, I would say, 20 below zero centigrade, and I'm not used to it because Indonesia is the tropical climate. Well, anyway, so... I was raised in such a way that I had to take care of my brothers and sisters, younger brothers and sisters. So when I grew up, so that's my job to, to speak. And so all my t my time, free time, or you know, whatever you call it, I had to spend taking care of my younger brothers and sisters. So uh, many times, especially when you go to school in high school in Holland, there's a lot of subjects you have to take it four languages you have to learn, and of course all the others too, you know, but uh, I don't have the time really, because every time I have a free time, I have to take care of my young brothers and sisters. I also I have to go to the grocery stores. Well, in, in that particular time, every store has its own little thing, okay? You get, when you want to buy, buy some bread, you go to the bakery. When you buy some meat, you go to a meat store, okay? So all those stores, you have, so you have to travel a lot, and so it's really time consuming. And then on top of it, I had to study, and I have a hard time studying because in my case also, my parents, of course, and my, even my older brothers, what they say is law, it's, it's our tradition. So every time I want to say something, nope, I cannot say anything, I cannot say my opinion, I just have to listen and obey, period. So I, I, I grew up that way and it was very, very painful. I remember even when I was getting become a teenager or a young man, so to speak, uh, I tried to do certain things, uh, say I read a book or listen to radio. Nope. They say, well, you have time, you do this, you do this, you do this. You know, constantly, I, a lot of, constantly I'm doing chores, you know. And so, because of that pressure, I couldn't really study. I'm not that good, so then later, I had to go to a private school, and so uh, it, then after that, I quit. I quit high school, so to speak, and then the private school too, because you know when you when you get out 17, 18 years old, you like to go out and things like that. But I, my parents don't let them don't, don't you know kept me out of our, kept me in a, in a house, so to speak. And once in a while they let me go out, but it's for a short time. And at that time, at that particular time, I met a girl, I liked a girl, and I date her. But the only dates we have is I go to her house a little bit, and that was sitting with the parents, you know, because we don't have a phone, we don't have a car, we have, I have a bike. So that's how I spend my time. And the only time that we can be together, so to speak, I have to go to a movie theater, and so we can talk and, and you know, uh, hug each other, so to speak, yet it costs money. 
and my parents they don't give me any money. So I decided to work. And the sad part is this, even when I work, I still have to do you know, the babysitting and sometimes the laundry and the groceries. And on top of it, the worst part is, when what my earning, they demand, I give them at least 80 to 90 percent of my salary goes to my parents. So the little money I have, I have to sometimes save for a week, two weeks, be able to go to see a movie. That's how I was raised. And on top of the sad part is this, I, you know, I tell you this, my, even my brothers and sisters doesn't even know this because they don't realize what's going on. You know, after giving them money and things like it, uh, it's very painful because I don't have the freedom. Once in a while, for an hour or so, I could go out with the neighbors, you know, with the guys, and went out, we, you know, we just go to the city and things like it, and we joke a lot, you know. And this is really constantly in my life, and it was very, very sad that I was, so to speak, you know, the victim, may I use the word, because we call it over here in the United States being abused. But I left, I, you know, I went through it. So through my work, still meeting a girl, and uh, doing all those chores and things like it, we had the opportunity, you know, to immigrate to 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 the United States because they are open to immigration for my for my nationality. But I remember in Indonesia, we talk about when I was over there young and play with the boys and the girls. Well, more or less, no girls, boys more or less. We always tell us about stories, you know, about spiritual things, ghosts, and 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 tradition and. Certain things you do, you cannot do it, and like an omen and things like it. I didn't understand, but I knew something was wrong. And many times, when it's getting a little dark, you better go home. They get scared, you know, when you, you hear the stories. And I didn't know what it means, but ghosts and things like that. I know they are there. Indonesia is well known about the, about the black magic and things like it. So those things is happening over there, and yet I experienced something very bad too about spiritual things. But anyway, when I came to the United States, because I had no choice, I was only 20 years old, so I couldn't stay in, in Holland because there was a law at that particular time. And when I came back, when I was in the United States, I had the same problem. Uh, hard for me to find a job because I had no occupation, no education, so to speak. So I decided to go in, in the Army. And there, I tell you, man, I, the world's opened up for me. I didn't know what's going on and the language they use, the swearing and cussing. Now I know what it is, but at that time I didn't know. And every time, of course, I would say 85% or more, they always put me what in the kitchen. They go with KP, you know, because I don't know what to say. I don't know how to respond. I don't know how to uh, uh, say my opinion because I've been taught if I do this, Boom, I get a slap in my face or I get punished and I'm restricted, okay? So this is how I live, even though I was a young man already. The beautiful part is, when I came out of the service, I learned something. In the service, the same thing, they sent me to, uh, you know, to Germany and I, I was stationed in a small town, about 20,000 soldiers over there. And in a little town, there's about 200 prostitutes, I would say, you know, at the bars over there. So what I do, I like to dance, I've been, I'm a pretty good dancer. So I go with the Germans to a, what they call the, the turn hall to, you know, to dance. But of course, we have to be back by uh, 12, or, you know, at, at 12 o'clock at night. So that I do. And I had a friend of mine, you know, he's Gordon Fisher. I was, I'm dark, if you notice. My friend, the blonde guy. <laughs> Skinny like me, also skinny, so we, we, we made it pretty good, you know. So I learned from him the language a little bit here and there. So I, I had a pretty good time, but when it comes to going to the bars and things like it, sorry, I didn't go, I don't like it, and I know many times they have fights. You just picture it, the soldiers over there, they defeat the girls, but they, the, you know, the army, you have to go back by, by 12 o'clock. Here comes the other ones, more or less the, the Air Force and things like, and they take the girls out because they can be gone till 
6, 7 o'clock in the morning. So there's always fights and sometimes killing. It's very bad. But anyway, in the United States, uh, after I came out, I've learned, and my parents even though, and I found a job because I get a little bit understanding the language better, I know what the screwdriver is or what the you know, hammer is. Before I had two left hands, I didn't do it. So I worked for a company who was from Bill, you know, that the owner was from Switzerland. And those, what they call it, automatic, Swiss automatic screw machines make very, very small parts, very precision. And some way, somehow, I've learned little by little. And so uh, I developed a, a, a skill, may I use the word, okay? So that was beautiful, and I was making pretty good money. And when I was home, my parents did the same thing to me. I have to, you know, give them the money. So I thought to myself, well, the heck with it. I'll get a little more educated from the army, being self-independent. Uh, in so I told my parents, you know what? I move out. So I did, and they were laughing at me because they knew, they felt, I will never survive. Well. I was very scary. I lived by myself in an apartment. I work, and I'm very fortunate. The company I work for, you have to work, generally speaking, I say, you know, 55 hours a week. So you can imagine the overtime and things like it. So working, learning, and growing. And uh, then the, later on, the, move, the company moved to another place. So through all those things, and with all the overtime, you know, I'm learning things from, uh, and I'm very independent because what I just told you, what I've learned in the army. So I was saving the money when I was a little bachelor. Um, I bought a new car, and then I bought a house because I believe if I want to start a family in the future, I'm the breadwinner. I don't want my wife to work. That's my philosophy. I've seen my parents, you know, my parents, how they live. So, and I, that's why it's in my mind. So I work, I have those things. Yes, later, and I think I'll share with you already in the beginning, I'll, you know, I, I get married and things like that. But the whole point is this, there is still something that drove me to ask questions, okay? So after my marriage, and I, um, I tell you this, I will tell you right now, my proposal to my wife, and she's American, all my family didn't like it. They expect me, you know, to marry my own nationality, the culture, and also, uh, you know, we hear things how they think, the Americans, generally speaking, our culture is completely different, but, you know, I mean, in the beginning, I had a, my own nationality, and, you know, I was even engaged. But I found out that for me, that, you know, when I have my own nationality, that person is like a sister to me. I don't feel that close. So I had to break up and, and, and then later, you know, like I said, I, I met, we worked in the company I worked for. I met a, uh, you know, my wife. And so, but when I was dating her, I dated her for about three months. And our date is, I was playing soccer and she listened to the uh, eight-track, you know, music. That's our dates. But uh, I told my wife, you know, already, and I told her before, I'm a serious guy. I want, you know, I like to build a family. And I still feel I'm responsible. So, after about three months, I approached, uh, you no, know, my wife, of course, and I told her this. Listen, I said, I like to be married, you know, I like to have a family. I said, but there's only three things I'm going to tell you. So about my proposal to my wife. I said, I'm the head of the house. I'm looking for a housewife. And I promise you that before I cheat, I will tell you first. So think about it. And I let it go. That was my proposal to my wife. That particular time, of course, is a girlfriend. And I tell you, two weeks later, she came to me and she said, she accepted because she also had a hard time at home. She has to, you know, give all the money, to, so to speak, to the parents because they were alcoholics. 
and she was not happy. The whole her whole family, generally speaking, are alcoholics. So you can imagine, some way somehow we fit together, same hardship, you know, and and, and pressure and things like that. So she says, okay. I arranged everything in one week. And I tell you, man, the gossip, because the company I work for, we work in the same company, my family and her family, uh, it's 150 people, employees, you know. And I told my wife, they're going to gossip. Well, they did, you know, but we didn't care. We went, we went through the whole thing. And so, through this, and her parents didn't like me, I was dark. They kind of what they call a redneck. That's pretty tough, you know. I didn't know what it meant at that time, but now I know. So anyway, that was the beauty, okay, how we came together. And so, as time went by, two years later, we started a family. And I think I wrote also in my, in my one of my uh, explanation, I, uh, she asked me to go to church. I said, okay. Let's try it. I'm on, I've been the head of the house. Let me find out what it's all about. So I went with, him, with her to the church, and I learned about the gospel. And as time went by, I felt, you know, that I should... I believe, you know, that's my, that's my, that's, that's my thing. As I've learned about the black magic, I do believe, and I look even look up there, must be a creator. So I came to the Lord. I went, we, went, we went to a small... Uh, Baptist Church, and I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if you're really there, if you're really real, because I know the enemy is real, and some people don't even believe that, thing, but Satan is real. I think my 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 uh, video just before this, I shared with you who Lucifer was, okay, or Lucifer is. So I came to the Lord. I said, God, so I heard about Christ and things like it, because in Europe, you, you learn this, you know, they tell you stories about Goliath and David and different stories, you know, about war and how the Israelite, you know, has ever had battles here and there. So but we know the story, but they never explain to you or explain you to you theology. They just tell you stories. So okay. So I came to the Lord. I said, Lord, if you're really there, show me who you are. And I was over there about two months, some something like that, three months, and the pastor spoke. And he mentioned about Hebrews 13, you see right there, that the beautiful scripture says, I will never forever forsake you. When I heard it, I tell you folks, it hit me right between the eyes, and I said, who is that? I want to know who, the, who said that. Later, of course, I found out it was Christ who said it, okay, it's his words. So, I give my heart to the Lord. And I was so excited because now I know. But when I, when they, the Bible called it born again. When I was, when I became a Christian, believe me, I knew. Okay, and God showed me as time was by. Okay, the meaning of it, and my heart was so joyful that in my mind, and I read the scripture where it says, "Everything belongs to the Lord. Give your house and things away." Everything belongs to the Lord. If you really want to serve the Lord, He will guide you. So, like I said, I did accept the Lord. And my heart, right there, I even went to the pastor. I said, listen, I want to be baptized. He said, are you sure what you know what you're doing? I said, I want to be baptized. See, I know baptism has nothing to do with my salvation. It is after I'm saved. That's different. I know that. I read the scriptures, you know, because... God spoke to me, I mean, with my background and things like it, and like it says, it's God is spirit, right? So he spoke to me through his word, and I said, that is for me, and I said, I told the Lord, I have three things in my heart, what I desire to have as a gift. And I asked the Lord, I like to have the wisdom, and knowing the word to teach, and helping people to do good goods. So those three, I asked the Lord, I like to have that. And I do know if you, if you read an Acts tells you right there, the gift of, of the Spirit. So I asked the Lord, give me that. I want to go out and tell people about who you are. Now I know I know that where my, my eternity is with you. 
There is no doubt about it. So I said, help me to share it with others. That was already, you know, in the beginning. And folks, I tell you, the Lord heard my prayer. And then come the hardest part. At least, you know, I was surprised. I was involved with different organizations and things like that, and going to people with the church and learning the Bible and going to Bible study. I'm still working 55 hours constantly. So as time went by, you know, and my wife didn't have to work. I told her she worked, you know, in the beginning, but maybe for a year or so. And I told her, you don't have to work. I'd like you to be home, be a housewife, I told you. But so she did. We started a family, you know, two years later after we were married. And so this is how it started, okay? I raise the children the best I can, you know. And so, you know, we always in the family, you know, in, when you, in life you have you up and down, but it was great. Then one day I had an opportunity. I met a family from Indonesia, what they call from the Bethel Church, okay? He was the head of whole in Indonesia in the Bethel Church. So he invited me to go and maybe and pray, they pray with me, and I remember my wife, of course. Maybe I should go to Indonesia as a missionary or, you know, whatever. So I, I was excited, you know. My wife was not excited. She doesn't like to go into Indonesia. It's tropical. She hates when she sees a little, you know, bug or like that. Oh, she, you know, and that's Indonesia is well known, what, you know, those things. So, and through prayer, God says, no. I want you to go back to Holland. Oh, was I mad. What was I mad? Because... My problem is my hands. My hands are always cold. I have a bad circulation. That's one of the reasons why I don't like to go to any, any country who is cold. But, you know, as time went by, I fought the Lord for about six months. Then I said, okay, Lord, I better, be, I better obey. You want me to go to Holland? Okay. And you know what? First, before I went to Holland, I went to a missionary school. And I went over there for about two months. Something happened. They had, I believe, the, the wrong doctrine. I didn't know, of course, because, you know. But anyway, when I went to the school, I, we gave up. I have to say, I'll my mind. We gave up our property and our home. I just gave it away, so to speak. The property we gave back to the owner because he, I found out he needed it. So I said, okay, give us some money back. Because, you know, and my home, I gave it to my young brother. He said, you can have it. Just give me this kind of money after, after you have the money because I had some repairs done, you know. I, had, I owned the, the, the bench something. So I went to the school. Folks, two months later, I found out the wrong doctrine. You know, I'll tell you what a doctrine is because I had to be honest to you. Losing salvation. My God, what was I hurt when I heard that? So, what I did, I fasted for a couple of days and said, Lord, I cannot believe that they can believe that. And I don't see it in the scripture, but a little bit I know. So, I went to the Lord, I fasted, and God pulled me out. I went to a pastor who, you know, who believes in that, but I asked him a certain question. He says, no, it's not true. So, I... I can't tell you everything in detail, but it's not my, 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 my purpose because then people get maybe get mad or confused, but that was the main reason, okay? So I came out, here I'm out to school, no home, no job, nothing. And I have to find a job and to live in an apartment. It was a disgrace for me. But I had no choice. God has a reason, but I didn't understand that time. I found a job. I found a, an apartment. And we had to live in a bad neighborhood because it's all I could afford. And that's how I start working again and building up. It was very, very scary. And yet through this also, my wife was attacked with a nervous breakdown. For nine months, she could not move, so to speak. 
Lucky, one of the ladies from the, in the church, in my own, it was a special church from my own nationality, 85% of my own nationality. We had to drive about 45 minutes. She came and helped my wife and the kids while I'm working. That's a miracle, folks. Nine months he pulled through. That was very scary, believe me. Uh, you know, so different miracles happen. I cannot go in detail because I can write up books, you know, but the, the things happening, okay? But anyway, so in a nice way, I was going to go to Holland, right? Now it stops, so to speak. So I went, start building again. A year or two later, I, I bought a house, better area and things like it. And there I started again, start growing, in a word, but the desire is still there. Then I knew, okay, maybe the timing when I said about the calling, okay, could be later, okay. I Sometimes I forget exactly the time, but I remember that I, I, I didn't want to go to Holland, and God kept pounding in my head, go to Holland, to minister, okay, because I had a little background, a, bit, a little training, and I was scared, believe me, you know, and to the country. And the law in Holland is, I'm very fortunate at that time, I was still a Dutch citizen. And I knew if I go to Holland, the government will take care of me. Socialism. But going back to Amsterdam, in a city, and I'm not used to that, you know, I live in a nice home with the, with the yard, you know, our homes are outside. It, now I have to go back to a city? I tell you folks, it was very, very painful, just a thought. And I had a good job. They paid me well. I don't have to ask for races. They just gave it to me. I was getting that well, that good. God, somebody somehow gave me the gift. But like I said, I had to make a choice, right? Am I willing to be obedient? And that was the hardest part for me. But after a while, I gave in. And we went. I'd like to continue next time a little further what's going on. And I hope, you know, that through this little testimony you understand what's happening to me, but how God works. Folks, I can tell you miracles after miracles, but it will be in my next, you know, in my next tape to give you a little more detail what happened in the family and through the family, what happened in Holland and how God spoke to me and taught me how to trust Him. Because, Lord, the Bible says this in Mark 8, 36, so that, What does it profit a man when he conquered the whole world but loses his soul? A big zero, folks. A big zero. And I told you before in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, what? Salvation is a free gift. Can you imagine that what God has, He will share with me? I will spend eternity with Him? Is that not worth it just to follow Him? I thank you for your time. Thank you for stopping by. Like I said before, if you have any, anything out of the video, please give me a thumb up. If you subscribe, please. Ring the notification bell. Okay? I thank you and God bless you.